All right, everybody, here's a tractor construction set part number three. And let me see myself at Jitsi Meet here with my camera. Tractor construction set three. So let's go over, uh, so we're going through a series of videos on how to design a tractor from scratch. This is based on all the learnings, perhaps of the last uh, near decade of, of work of about eight prototypes that we've done here factory farm so to review so tractor construction set session three in the last two sessions we've gone through the conceptual design of the tractor construction set for reference the documents of interest are the page on the wiki called tractor construction set 2017 so that's the title of the page uh, and in there I will be referencing the document from part one the working doc right here which I have in another tab uh, for reference on some of the things I want to show you so please review those two former if you miss them. So in part one we covered the conceptual design for the tractor construction set, a highly modular system of design with interchangeable parts, modular frames, modular wheel units, modular power units, everything in it being modular to allow for rapid building. So Ahmed, hey, so I'm, I'm just starting re reviewing the last two weeks of, uh, of design and I'm recording this for everybody. So uh, overall conceptual design of the tractor construction set in part one, we covered the universal wheel units which are modules that can serve many functions including the use for tracks as well as round rubber wheels or steel wheels or whatever drive system you like. And then we covered the geometry options for a scalable tractor, what kind of uh, considerations there are for the tractor to be able to fit on a road, to be able to turn, to have the size to fit everything that it needs to, to increase traction or to be a very small tractor. Okay, so in the part two we started on um, the actual drive sprocket design, so the drive system as well as the track design and track tensioning. So focusing on the traction aspect as opposed to wheels, since traction is a really desirable feature for any off-road machine if you're doing construction or agriculture work, just if you're talking about traction, tracks are it. So now in part three we're gonna start getting into the conceptual details of a minimum size tractor. So for the builds in um, here we have a build coming up. We're going to put that on the calendar. Uh, we're looking at right now for October 15 uh, because uh, September 30 we're actually looking at another 3D printer workshop off-site. So we're looking at uh, settling on a date of October 15 for the build here and we got to put that on a calendar and basically say that's our window of opportunity for the next iteration of the tractor. But the minimum viable product that we talked about uh, in meeting number one uh, so this would be the base small scale unit which then can readily be be translated into larger size units so for example if you want to make a decision oh well can I get away with a small tractor well I want a bigger one well the small tractor will teach you and will be designed such that the the enhancement to larger size or more power or anything else are feasible right away but for the minimum size tractor we're working on on the size scale of 16 horsepower for the base engine units we're also working on a power cube in the meantime so there's another um, on a dev log developer log which is a page uh, our standard page for anyone else who hasn't seen that development team log is where we record all our meetings the last meetings the last design sprint uh, one of the last design sprints was on the power cube so we're going well on that and the power cube is, will be built uh, in less than two weeks here for the next iteration of a more simplified one that uh, as we go forward we're trying to really simplify um, I mean the learnings from the 2015 builds of the tractor were that yes the modularity works also we learned some details of how to make things I mean every time we build it we learn how to do things easier and easier so we're taking that forward to make really rapid interchangeable kind of a design system uh, as part of this work so today let's go over the the consider considerations for the minimum size tractor and as I said the the idea is that if you're concerned about uh, okay so first of all let me share my screen since you guys are not 
Not seeing that. And once again, the main working dock for today is just this simple one right here, which I'm pasting into the chat box. And I'll include that in a link in, uh, once the video is posted. So that's the working dock. We're, we'll be referring to the former working dock, which is the second former dock right there. And the overall tractor construction set 2017 page is where we're keeping track of all the tractor construction set meetings. So that's the link to the wiki page. Now, uh, let's shut the development team page here. Let's let's go right through with the concept design for a minimum scale tractor, which which we want to build. So platform. Referring back to this kind of a platform, like we can do a version that's similar to this one that you see here. So I'll paste that into our as our working document for visual reference. But the platform refers to that flat frame that carries the tracks. Okay, so a flat frame. Let's talk about that. Why? It's a, it's the most simple thing. Now, typically we do cubic space frames, right? Well, um, the cubic space frame would make it a little more difficult for you to mount a power cube on top there. So um, this flat frame allows several things. It allows your wheel mounting. You can put flat plates on the side to, to mount wheel units. It allows the mount mounting of a tensioner system, which I'll discuss. It allows the power cube to go simply on top of this platform and it can be enlarged. So like, for example, last year we did a platform like just like this, which was which made an eight foot wide tractor. So like a 2.5 meter wide tractor um, using this once again, the same flat frame, because then you can put, say, the cab or a power cube on top of that. Now, in, a, in an absolute minimum version, we can have a very small tractor like this that just carries the tracks, a power cube and a person can walk behind. So in a walk behind configuration, it would be um, the flat, the, the minimum point of reference would be like the Toro Dingo. Um, so Google that. That's a small scale utility tractor on a scale of 18 horsepower. Uh, and I'm gonna let you, I'm changing that the edit permissions here so you can edit this as well. If you want to paste a picture of the Toro Dingo, please do so. The Toro Dingo is our reference industry standard that we can base this work upon. So let's talk about next slide, uh, the frame, uh, the base, and go just go through the, the design considerations. So duplicate the slide. Um, so now frame, so this platform frame frame okay so you see here the simplest design uh, has three basically three longitudinal members and why we did that was because the universal wheel unit has such a mount system that it takes two of those members and you can put the universal rotor on top of that that frame there um, so, so it's it's one way to do it, and, and I'm just gonna show that which we have experience with and which works, and uh, using the modular box beam tubing, that is the key to modularity, and it allow it has bolt holes already, so we can mount everything to that. So it allows for design for disassembly. So the base design was these three, uh, basically three beams, and then you've got. And they're really separated by four inches because these are four inch beams. And they it looks like this. So now the next question is based on this. Okay, what exactly is the length of this? 
So the engineering comes from, okay, what exactly is the length uh, to, to allow everything to fit? Uh, the width, the minimum width that we can take would be uh, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20 inches. That would be 20 inches. But here the question, we can put a question mark for what exactly is the right width based on the fact that we're going to attach two, two track, uh, two basic, two idlers and tracks onto this, like, like we talked about before. So now in this case, so flat platform plus uh, the rotor. So let's talk about the rotor. So the rotor is going to be mounted somehow uh, here. And I, what I would suggest for the rotor mounting, it would be mounted something like, like this here. So let's uh, color that in. So that would be a plate upon which the rotor can mount. Okay. So the rotor would be the the hydraulic motor, and the shaft would be would be here, let's say, and then you can put one on the opposite side, naturally. Uh, for for two sided drive, that means you can turn, so this allows you turning. There you go. You've got a base minimum tractor drive system. Uh, and these two fit together. On, on the same level, in other words, the tracks will not be like before we had the staggered tracks. Here now the track drive will be on the same side. So so you got the motor on a mounting plate. Now the mounting plate would actually be bolted to the outside of the frame through the first two holes. Now you can't put, you know, one thing is, I mean, you can't put this plate right here unless you, you made, um, you can if you did, uh, uh, you see what I'm saying here. Um, there's a tube here that has the hollow part right here, so you can't mount the plate to that. But you could do this if, if you made this, this last beam here go in between, like basically two small beams right here, and therefore you'd still have the holes available um, for the motor going all the way to the edge. Here we can't use this space because there, there is no mounting bolt holes. Uh, but as you see here, we have this, we have the the mount plate all the way to the edge because um, this beam spans to the end. Here and the way I drew it here is a little different but probably the configuration like you see in the last time where you have this spanning beam here in between the two so you actually do have bolt holes available all the way to the end is a good idea because otherwise we've got this empty space here that's not being used. So probably the better idea would be just like this. Um, hide that. So these are some of the details, just some of the very basics of design here. So it would be like that, where you're actually stretching these members across, and the the end beams. Uh, call this the end end beam. Uh, they're actually spanning between the two long beams, so that actually now we can move the motor all the way here, which is good, but. If we do that, uh, how do we do the tensioning? So we discussed the tensioning mechanism uh, last week. Okay, so let me actually move this back because uh, uh, I want to add a tensioning mechanism here. So moving right along, so we've got the the universal rotor mounted, and it's not this universal rotor. It's just a, like like I discussed before. Okay, we got to mute some people back there. Mute. Mute, okay. Um, right, so... So just note that these universal motors, these are basically the hydraulic motors mounted to a plate. They don't have the whole mounting assembly. We're going simpler. That plate mounts to the, the beam and the motor bolts through its four bolt hole pattern to that plate. Okay. Now let's talk about. Um, so let's talk about the next piece added to this puzzle, which is tensioning. So we're gonna have tracks here. Um, so in order to before the tensioning is tracks, and before the tracks is idlers. So idlers plus tracks plus tensioning because you have to tension tracks so they're not floppy okay so we've got these motors I'm gonna just draw one more little detail and that's the motor shaft 
uh, that's going to be the motor shaft. On that motor shaft is going to be the drive sprocket, which is a clamp on drive sprocket or however we do that. So there's details there. That's going to be the uh, drive sprocket on each side. So that's your, uh, I mentioned in one of the last meetings, we generated that in open SCAD. Uh, you, there's parametric design of sprockets in open SCAD if you ever get into that. But we've got a sprocket that we've used before. We can use that s same one because it works. Uh, so we've got the sprockets and shafts. Okay. Idlers. So here's the idlers. Basically the free spinning. Uh, so the idler is this part. It's the free spin spinning. Uh, basically a track. A guide for the track to, to roll in. It consists of this this cylindrical structure with lips so the track doesn't fall off it and it consists of two bearings and a shaft collar and a shaft goes through that. The way we did our shaft, so let's talk about um, the shaft. So before we have idlers we have a shaft upon which the idler sits and the shaft is not shown here. Uh, the mounting plates are shown but that hole is where the shaft goes through the idlers. Now the way we did the idlers before was with a shaft so now you've got a, a shaft that runs through that this whole system. I'm gonna do that the shaft in blue. Uh, so the shaft spans under the frame and you notice here it's on it's through shaft it's not just one piece here and, and another two piece on the other side it goes through spans under the entire frame now why do you want to do that that makes for a stable design where it's firmly attached and these mount shaft plates would be these ones here uh, to detail that these things these are the shaft mounting plates those two holes go go into the these go into the frame and this is the shaft hole but that's the mounting plate so I'm gonna draw that little just a representation of that so basically the there's the plate uh, that mounts the shaft so that's underneath there uh, let's put another one on the other side that's underneath there and then there's ones And then there's the plate that's here that's holding this shaft and this this other side here so it's a very firm support underneath the the frame these plates are half inch steel they're bolted to the frame so now let's talk about the idler so the idler would be now um, here four idlers uh, so we can represent the idler like maybe like this here uh, let me zoom in on that but idler looks somewhat like this it's basically a cylinder structure between these two things and these these uh, plates here are flared out a little bit so that the the track drives on this so that's how that's how the idler looks pretty much uh, that's a simplified version of that just to explain how it all looks so that's on each wheel now here I'm drawing a platform that is so that will be below that and of course the sprocket will be driving the track so it's under the sprocket so move that under there so that's that's how it looks now what's this uh, so we talked about what is this minimum distance that we should have that's to be determined um, and that and the geometry so let's maybe move on to the slide duplicate slide next next slide um, so then platform dimensions so frame dimensions so we have this question mark here well 
um, let's put some requirements what what's required there so requirements let's list them you need to mount mount motors need to mount motors idlers uh, and then you also the tension I didn't talk about the tensioner let's get to that next so let's do uh, Oh, let's let's put that in red here for now to let's go to that next you need to mount and then you also need the power cube right the power cube is on top so somewhere you need to hold a power cube and somewhere if we have any of a functional Toro Dingo like structure so look at this that's the Toro Dingo that's what we're talking about uh, so we're doing the open source Toro Dingo here so that's what the machine looks like. You got your tracks, you got your base. You know, it's all nice and neat, very custom parts. We are blocky and square. But you need loader arms. We're going to have to have some loader arms there because that's what you attach all kinds of implements to. Uh, here, what do they have? A grapple for lifting things. What the Toro Dingo has is a walking platform for the operator on the back with, with all the controls. So that's that's kind of the model that we're thinking. And it has rubber tracks. We're going to use steel tracks. However, we are getting prepped for the the rubber tracks. We're planning on a 2 by 2 foot machine. So the latest on the tracks is a 2 by 2 foot print platform, which al would allow us to print in rubber. So you can print rubber. Uh, we're going to design a, an extruder for rubber. It, it's just a slightly modified version of the regular extruder that we have. So we're going to get to working on the extruder and the 3D printer uh, team. Um, but um, getting back to the dimensional considerations, that, that distance between the, like the minimum distance, let's talk about, let's talk about that. Um, that could be literally touching one another in the absolute, absolute minimum case. Now, it would not have a lot of stability. So there's power cube, loader arms, our requirements, there's the tensioner, and now let's go to uh, stability requirements. The stability requirement is such, such that the wheelbase has to be significant enough forward and back such that when you lift something or you put a load on the front, the tractor, the little tractor doesn't just tip over. So it has to have stability requirement. Um, center of gravity basically the requirement is the tractor cannot tip if it has a heavy load on the front primarily because the operator on the back is pretty light typically if it has a heavy load on the front what is the size of that heavy load I would say that heavy load we we should design the minimum version here for 500 pounds that's uh, that, that's about I think what the Toro Dingo has but we should be thinking about if you put something on like you know you have a, maybe a trencher a backhoe implement a uh, tiller a grapple like that whatever you have you, uh, we should be able to handle 500 pounds easily uh, 500 is enough? it's not I mean, it's not enough for the big versions, but I'm saying this is the minimum viable product, right? So requirements for a minimum version. Uh, a practical version for... And I mean, we can... Let's start that as a minimum requirement, but we can take that up. But I'm just saying we cannot go lower than that because, I mean, it would be impractical. But you could think about it as if we can easily get above 500, what I would like, for example, like a very practical thing... In agriculture is lifting hay bales, the big round bales, they're 2,000 pounds. So we're going to need that kind of level of duty. And uh, right now, I'm, I'm, what I'm really designing is a Katerina tractor. That's my wife, an open source developer. Um, but she's a use case for the absolute minimum case that you can do work around the garden. 
uh, Ahmed, look up what the Toro Dingo weight specs are for the front loader. Uh, so we can have a point of reference, but I, I believe it was about 500. So, and no, it's not enough for the heavier duty things that we're going to do in the future. And that's why we're going to scale this up to various sizes. So, uh, so the stability requirement is a big one. Now, both side to side, uh, the center of gravity uh, at the front. So at the front, 500 pounds. And then the other part is low center of gravity. So you do not tip side to side, low center of gravity. For which reason, the platform like we had here, we actually put the power cube over the top of these tracks. That made the machine like almost six feet high, really not acceptable for tipping hazard. Um, so we want to try to keep the, the height as low as possible. So that means the power cube has to reside here uh, on the tracks, which may mean that this distance here is probably gonna in between the tracks needs to be that distance so the tracks are gonna be between the sp idlers but that's gonna be have to what I'm showing right there that's gonna have to hold the width of a power cube and the way we're showing it right now it doesn't I don't think it does so we'll have to redesign. So, so we're starting here from the requirements and then we figure out the exact geometry once we figure, once we put the requirements into consideration. So this width here really must accept the power cube because otherwise the center of gravity would not be low enough and that's by the low center of gravity requirement. Cannot be above the tracks because the tracks are quite high here. They're, I mean, they're above the tracks are above this, you know, they top out at the sprocket, uh, which is, let's say, almost a foot above the the frame. So width must accept power cube. And we can, you know, that's one way to do it. Uh, we might look at other configurations. Like what I'm showing here is what we've shown that works and is, is an easy to do uh, configuration. Uh, but we might come up with other designs. So that must accept the power cube by the low center of gravity. Uh, so then from these considerations, we're going to get the length, the width, uh, and this, this, this width of the power cube depends on our results from the, the power cube design that we're doing right now, like the frame. Uh, so we have to consider making it as narrow as possible. Uh, perhaps long, yeah, I mean narrow, I mean that's, yeah, narrow. The limit is going to be like, we were talking about a 27, 24 inch power cube. That's, if we can get into 24 inches, we, we would be pretty good. But uh, I can tell you right now that, uh, let's just move over to the power cube for a second. Control T here. Uh, if you go to my log, I'm going to just uh, show you something from my log. I was working on, an, on a visual bill of materials for the power cube and looking at some of the basic considerations for size. And it's probably going to have to be more than 24 inches cube. So here I have power cube 17.08, uh, which means August 17 version. So the, so the visual BOM document here on that page shows the basics of dimensions. And, and what I saw is that the engine is 90, about 19 inches on its minimum side. And then you still have the hydraulic tank and you still have the fan somewhere. So let me just show you the the latest on the dimension. So this is the visual bill of materials for the power cube, which all these parts are ordered. Uh, but this is like the minimum simplest way we can do it. If you look at this, like from the top view, right here, engine with pump, hydraulic tank, looks like the minimum we're gonna have is like 28 inches by 24, probably. Uh, based on this, the engine mounting, engine dimensions being here, 
to emphasize those, those are the engine dimensions for the minimum engine. So width is 18.5 inches. So if that's 18.5 inches, we can probably fit the fan on the side if this is looking from the front. Uh, but the length is probably going to have to be like 20, 28 inches. And we can probably get away with 24. But if we do 24, the hydraulic pump will be sticking out the power cube. Because because uh, you can't, I mean, with this engine being like the depth, let's say the depth with the shaft is say like 20 or it's either 20 or it's 19, about about 20. You still need to add the length for the the coupler and the and the pump, so the pump might be sticking out the frame, which is not great. We should have it all enclosed within the within the power cube so it doesn't get damaged. But we'll see what we can do. It would be acceptable within the tractor itself. Like for example, if we if we're doing a minimum tractor size, and this power cube has its pump sticking out just a little bit. That would be like all right. I mean, not too bad. It's not. It won't be sticking out beyond the actual idlers and shafts. So we'll have to see how that works. Okay. So that's the considerations for frame dimensions. Now let's talk about the tensioner. So uh, duplicate slide, and it's slow here. I am bogged down here. Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about tensioner. Track tensioner. And after this, after tensioner, let's talk about the missing link, which is the loader arms. Okay. So, so the tensioner design involves fixed so let's do this and let me discuss this so it this time it should involve fix fixed idler mounting and let me explain it so in the former tractor here uh, the idler mounting on the front here so let me zoom into that so you see the front the front part there you see that elongated hole we did the tensioning under the tractor, like tensioners were down there. So a couple of issues. One is that you're pulling on the shafts, which is, I think it's easier if we pull on the actual motor. So, so one is it's kind of hard to access and you have to make these elongated holes instead of fixed shaft holes. It's a little, little um, I think it's going to be a little more difficult to do this than to do the next iteration where think about uh, the motors here that you have let's just move the motors instead of moving the shafts and tracks uh, on the shafts um, the experience behind that is that you have to reach basically the the tensioner mechanism is mounted under the frame where it's hard to access and if you're trying to do the tensioning um, for example in a in a configuration where you have a train train of these tractors one behind each other or sometimes it could be inaccessible like for example if you have the loader in the front and a platform in the back or you're you've got a train configuration where you have uh, two of these tractors pulling one another uh, as a possible scaling configuration uh, you're going to run into cases where the tensioner is not easily accessible. And certainly if the tensioner were on the front and you have the loader in the front, that's actually very dangerous because then you have to be doing the tensioning under the loader. 
uh, which is a crushing hazard. Um, so for the reason that it's, I think primarily that it's not that easily accessible and harder to fabricate because you got to fabricate, well, if you're CNC cutting the elongated holes, that's not a problem. But um, it's actually easier and more accessible when you have the, the tensioning mechanism on top. So what we can do here is design now our, uh, so I, I mentioned fixed idler mounting. So no, no longer an elongated hole. for mounting one of the idlers for mounting the mounting an idler pair so fixed idler mounting so the tensioner therefore if we can we can instead moves the tensioner moves the motors to tension the the tracks So I haven't drawn this mechanism in here, but what I could foresee is that uh, the way that the motors are mounted, they need to both be simply pulled by some kind of a pull mechanism. So think of, of some uh, tensioning bolts or something that pulls on both of the motors at the same time. And that's what tensions the track, like we discussed in the last time. Uh, let me go to that document for reference. We talked about how if you you can, let's see. I'm going back to the, yeah. Uh, someone trying to speak? Yep, go ahead. Actually, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get a lot of what you said there. Um, can you try saying that again? Yes. Uh, uh, you are talking regarding the tension of the uh, as moving, cool, uh, yeah. moving, uh, and uh, uh, rocket. Yeah. The both sizes to put with the tension of all somehow to move it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but this is very hard design. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's got its challenges. Uh, can you maybe draw the concept somehow? Like so. So okay. So let's see. I, okay, I'm still kind of missing missing what you're saying. What's the summary of of how you're proposing the tensioning? Uh, the summary is uh, just moving the uh, metal pocket from the long connected the canal just to tension uh, later on. Uh, connected to the body. Yeah. Okay, I uh, still can't hear you too well, man. Can you like um, uh, open up a, s create a new slide, and just draw the simple concept? Can you do that? Um, I I just can't. Sound is kind of bad. I don't know if others are hearing, but it's not coming out on this side. Uh, so we can have the next slide, which is called the the Ahmed tensioner <laughs> all right uh, so maybe if you can do a conceptual concept drawing like what you're what you're thinking there okay, uh, make it as a so can you draw in there can you like do the simple shapes and stuff so uh, make it as a 
Yeah. No, there, I mean, there's a hundred ways to do this. And we're just trying to see, like, based on the experience of what we have with right here, that would be easy, you know, try to go for the easiest way. I can just say that the way we did it by pulling on a, on a shafts wasn't really that robust. Uh, well, I think the biggest part about it was that it's kind of hard to access. Um, because if you have the driver platform down there or the loader on the front, it's just not super easy. Typically, the tensioning on the tracks is done on the side of the tracks, but that means you've got a pretty complicated design of the actual whole idler assembly. Here, our idler assembly is just the shaft and bearings. I mean, it's so simple. It's like you cannot, I don't think you can do a simpler idler design, especially if they're fixed. It's just a plate, mounting plate, a shaft, and the bearings on the, on the cylinders. So they're very simple and able to be manufactured with stock off-shelf parts. Otherwise, you can be talking about more custom making. But um, maybe you can draw out what you're, what you're talking what you're mentioning and we can consider both options but the way I, I was thinking about it here uh, fix the idler mounting and the tensioner moves the motors therefore the challenge is how do you move the motors move both motors uh, just back and forth um, where you have to make sure that once you move them, then you attach them firmly so they don't move once once you got got them to the right position. But um, yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, that, that's that's a design point we have to figure out. Or the uh, the other option, the industry standard is not that super easy. I mean, they've got if you look at some of the designs, like let's see, maybe do we have any pictures? Yeah, if you go to some of the former former discussions on the on the drive sprockets and tracks comparing industry standards, you can see how how much more complex the other mechanisms are. Uh, and then uh, let's see, how does the Toro Dingo do it? Like, if you look at what they do, that's a that's a good point of comparison. But but look what they have there. I mean, look at it. It's this custom cut shape. They've got these. This would be the drive sprocket. They've got like one, two, three, four, five idler wheels. They've got this other wheel here. So we are, you know, our complexity level is like tenfold simpler. We just have two idlers, one in the front, one in the back. Forget about the ones in the middle. And that works. I mean, it works if you have the, the, the idlers spaced not too far from each other. But that works. I mean, we've uh, planted, um, you know, 10 acres of hazelnuts with this design. So this this thing, I mean, it's not uh, it's not a conceptual design. It's something we've used in the field last year for a few months of traction. So that was good. And for example, like using the the same tracks there. For example, when our van got stuck in a ditch, the white van, which is uh, 8,000 pounds, it, you know, we were driving the van on the field, watering the hazelnuts. It went into a gully and got stuck. And then we pulled it with the, the the tractor, and it just pulled it like it, it wasn't even there. Like there was nothing there. It just had 8,000 pounds. The traction on that the tractor was about 8,000 pounds, and it just pulled the thing right out of the ditch. So it's it works. We know it works. Um, and here they're actually very elegant. The the five of those idlers at the bottom. That's a standard track design. Like typically your big bulldozers all have that because the bulldozer track is pretty long. Uh, in, in our configuration here, the, you know, we can get away with fewer of those, those idlers, and it still works well. Now, the ten their tensioning mechanism looks like uh, whatever, it looks like that hole there, that probably is some kind of a tensioning mechanism there. Uh, I, d I can't really tell. It might be you turn one of these screws or something. I'm not familiar with it enough, but somehow these, these idlers have to come closer to one another. Something has to shrink up so that you can then put on the tracks and then tension them back up. But you see, I mean, this isn't, you know, it, with CNC cutting, we can do this, but they have the bend there and so forth. It's, you know, much more complex geometry than what we're talking about with like plates and shafts and 
and cylinders and stuff. And and for the loader, we definitely want to do a complicated design that that's optimized for geometry because the loader, yeah, that's that's pretty serious work. You can't do like your square loader shape. It's it would be really awkward. There we won't uh, make any compromise on the optimal geometry, but for the the track drive, we can do a uh, little simpler. And as we go along and we find that things aren't working, we can make things more complex, but at the beginning keep it most simple. So uh, just to finish off the the tensioning idea, basic thing, fixed idler mounting, tensioner moves the motors. So that's what happens there. So instead of moving the idlers, you're moving the motors to tension the tension the the deal just like you see in this picture here where you got the drive motor there you're moving it backwards and that's how you tension it now that means you have to if you're pulling it from the in this picture if you're pulling it from the right hand side here that means the frame and the mounting point for the tensioner the frame means frame must be extending more over here uh, so you have to here 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 or you can be possibly pushing it with a pusher tensioner from this side. Um, so yeah, I mean, we have to figure that out and, and get detailed on that. And I think perhaps that might be, you know, to complete the drive system, perhaps that is uh, the challenge here because our current state of art here is we, you know, we, we, we can claim that we've mastered the, the idlers, the just the idlers themselves, the shafts, the drive motors, the sprockets, it all works. The chain turns, it has huge traction to pull very heavy objects out of ditches and without slipping or anything. Un in whatever the weather, it's I mean this goes in mud or in on solid ground. So the tensioning is I think the tensioning detail. While while the tensional work tensioner worked last year um, some of the issues with it were that it would get loose after some time after the after the tracks maybe stretched a little bit it, it would get a little bit loose it had no spring mechanism and it was not spring loaded so you can say it's like a stiff uh, tensioner uh, I think the I've seen springs on the uh, tensioning mechanisms of other devices if you look at the Toro Dingo I don't know if there's any sprung mechanism there might be some spring action and uh, part down there I don't know but somehow we got to work it out so that's kind of the main consideration so from there at this point um, after this let's talk a little bit about the so that's the tensioner part uh, so let's create a new slide and let's just talk about the loader arms so somewhere you have to mount your lo loader arms and the way this frame is you can either do that on the on a power cube now our power cube the way we're designing it it's a quarter inch steel so i wouldn't call that sufficient for it's just like quarter uh we're not using the tubing in this power cube right so the tubing would would work well enough to attach a loader arm to here we don't have that so we can we need to put other weld on some other attachments or some plates to hang the loader arms so how do we do that let me do a duplicate the slide here so let's talk about loader mounting loader arm mounting so what are the considerations uh, let's start a fresh picture. So say you're looking at the frame from the side. So the frame from the side looks just like that. That's the frame. It just looks like one beam if you're looking at orthographically from the, the side of the tractor. In other words, the if the idlers are here that's going to be whatever your location of the idlers that have the tracks on them and that would be this would be your drive sprocket here let's say 
so of course the frame needs to be under mounting that somehow uh, so say that's the drive sprocket and you've got your your nominal uh, tensioned track around this there what do we do about the loader arms okay I don't know let's talk about it so so the easiest I mean one thing that comes to mind naturally is simple weld of another vertical tube now these are quarter inch steel tubing that would be good enough maybe you, you might need a uh, depending on how high it is you need to consider it accordingly the way that the Toro Dingo does it and that's a, that's a good point of reference because they've got the same tight type of configuration as we do what you see there their loader arm is not mounted very high at all um, I'm not sure about how their geometry works but it looks like that fixed pivot point is right there and so if we had a a mounting point right here we can do something like a front mounted cylinder I mean it's good to you know start with how they're doing it that's they're doing it well with enough vertical reach to to make it happen um, so in our case you know just some kind of a mounting point here you know say maybe 12 inches uh, and then maybe the cylinder the drive uh, the hydraulic cylinder which will color color in red here it might be mounted somewhere like right here um, so then your your loader arms I'm gonna just draw them like this here so that might be like your lo loader arm like this like that and like that and then a quick attach so that's your loader arm somehow so you're attaching to some point there uh, this is all negotiable this is this we got a design there's no design been done for that uh, so uh, this looks like a good configuration now you see an immediate issue here is where's the power cube going is it in between the loader arms yeah it would have to be uh, and if that's the case then you know we definitely have width configuration uh, considerations what I'm seeing immediately here is that this machine if you have a power cube sitting in between that which is what we how we do it we might be ending up with quite a wide machine I believe that the Toro Dingo is about three feet or 40 inches I think it's about 40 inches so like three feet four inches wide um, so definitely you get into some challenges as far as fitting the power cube cube on here so from the loader arms you would have some kind of a quick attach plate here to which you can attach your implements and then you would have another loader to to rotate the quick attach plate uh, what they have here on the Toro Dingo to look at that example again they have their one cylinder here and there should be another cylinder it's probably it's hidden in there looks like but there's probably another cylinder which which rotates the the mounting the mounting um, what do you call it the quick attach plate here uh, you want to rotate that so you can grab things and and rotate things so two sets of cylinders first thing would be to work out this cylinder and we can attach then we can work out the geometry on this the second cylinder here um, so that's that's where that is um, the next like right here the the main consideration let's just look at the requirements here so this is the loader arm design Uh, what I'm seeing here immediately is the power cube needs to fit between there. And just to summarize that, like say the power cube is, you know, say we've got a an elongated power cube that's, uh, oh, let's draw the, you know, 
you got a power cube that's let's let's say I'm looking from the top and that's your power cube let's say it's 24 inches on the side and we said it might be 24 by 28 so that's looking at the top of the power cube well um, if it's in between the tracks then this so let's draw the tracks so wherever the tracks are we mentioned before that the power cube might have to be between the tracks completely such that you're not the center of gravity is the lowest possible right so you've got the power cube in between the tracks so the absolute minimum width of the tractor here is going to be the width of the power cube which is about 24 plus the width of one track and the other track say the tracks are we, last time we did uh, 10 inch 10 inch wide uh, so you're adding 10 plus 10 plus 24 you're at 44 right there so definitely a challenge so that's 44 inches is a little under four feet it's over one meter but for the minimum scale machine, yeah, you're getting into um, some size issues there. Now we can possibly make these tracks a little more narrow, like let's say 8 inches. That would be acceptable. Or even like 6 inches. I mean, that's thin. But definitely still, if you've got 6, six inch wide tracks spread over the whole floor, of the, I mean, over the length, that's still very good traction. Um... And once again, referring back to the Toro Dingo, how wide their tracks are. I believe they're, um, not sure what they are, but I think they're like six or eight inches. I think probably like eight inches. I'm not really sure. We can look at, um, one of the things to do is look at all the specs for the Toro Dingo as a point of comparison. Their tracks are not very wide. So you can see is they're like six or eight inches. Space, 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 spaces. So that's definitely a consideration for us and for anyone does as a small garden machine or construction machine, you're getting right up close to buildings or in between aisles of plants or whatever you're doing. you wanna have I mean I would say we can we can definitely get away with six inch wide tracks. That would be very tiny, but still they would that's plenty of traction um, yeah I'm not sure what they are but they don't look very wide to me they're not at all so uh, I would probably like because of our width considerations I would just push that to the limit and make that about um, I would say six or eight inches for our version if we do that now let's uh, zoom out again here if we do that, then we've got the 24 inch, 24 inch wide power cube plus six plus six plus 12. That gets us 36, and then plus maybe a couple more inches spacing or whatever. Yeah, um, 36, 40 inches is what we should be uh, aiming for for the overall width of the tractor. Uh, so that would be our goal. I think 40 inches is quite good. That's, I believe, exactly what the Toro Dingo is. And that's that's very small. That's that's very compact. Uh, so 40 inch wide. Yet wide enough that it's not going to tip over. Uh, and if you keep the center of gravity low, lowest as possible, then you can do it. Okay, let's see what he's got. So, uh, ah, look at that. So, yeah, do a center idler there. Yeah. Uh, that's doable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Um, that's a doable configuration. Uh, there's definitely challenges to any of the ways we do it. Because if, if you do do that, what you showed here, Ahmed, then um, the mounting to the frame would have, to, would have to be a very solid thing. I mean, it's doable. But if you're mounting off the side of the frame... Yeah, yeah, doable, definitely doable. What I could see happening here is if you have a shaft going through that center, shaft going through the entire frame, that could be a very stable point for attaching the tensioner. I like it. So then you fix, yeah, and that might be, now that I see it, this might be actually much simpler than what I was trying to do, moving the, moving the actual drive sprocket. All right. So we can, we can try this. Uh, immediately, that looks like a, like a good idea. 
don't see any faults with that it's more parts it's this more another idler here but um, I mean compared to the complexity of dragging you know moving this thing back and forth this looks like a more more elegant solution um, uh, probably less of a part count than what we would do in a, in another way because I don't see a clear solution for how you can move the, the drive sprocket and then fix it at the end you'd have to have some kind of possibly an elongated hole or some some weird clamp like multiple clamp mechanism to make that all happen there so yeah this is this is conceptually very easy and definitely worth pursuing excellent so I would go for this as the initial design so let's go to the Ahmed tensioner yeah I like it we can consider this uh, the Ahmed tensioner also allows for fixed idler mounting instead of tensioner moving the motors you're just moving that extra idler so I like it and that idler could be exactly like our other idlers so we're not adding extra part count exactly like it or very similar to it it could be a smaller diameter radius definitely but the shaft through it could be the same like I would definitely see right now uh, one of the versions of the tractor we use one one and seven eighth inch shafts and one and seven eighth inch bearings so we can do probably something like that here for a small tensioner okay so I think that that, that wraps it up let's let's um, let's leave it at here that's the, our hour is up uh, so as we move forward we do the power cube we can when people can start thinking about it. if anyone's inspired to actually start cutting this out please do so but that's the basic design considerations at this point and we'll take it to next time next time we'll talk about I don't know what we'll talk about next time I have to think about it uh, depending on so the schedule is uh, the the brick press power cube workshop so we'll definitely continue working on a, on a power cube and once we nail nail down the power cube that's a good point for for being firm on what exactly we have to work with for the tractor design because that's that's going to be a, a big issue uh, regarding the final final dimensions of the power cube what what that ends up being so we have to move forward on that perhaps the next best step is to really nail down the power cube so we can work around that for the tractor and then uh, talk about our basic design configuration as far as the loader arm geometry I mean that will all depend on how the power cube is fitting in there so we can start drawing up conceptual designs I mean we can uh, the thing with the modular design is what we can do at this point is generate various sample files okay this is well first of all catting this up in FreeCAD so we have these modules to work with uh, but the frame you know we can design a, an initial frame design and so forth and these plates that all needs to get translated into FreeCAD so it's something that people can do in the meantime uh, as we work out the conceptual design so that's about it uh, any questions on this on this material yeah okay yeah so yeah let's continue I think the next major step is the specifics on the power cube so we can know exactly what we have to work with for the the power power side and and then go back to designing this and then probably iterating what we would see is okay after we got the power cube like we like it we might have to go back to the power cube and let's say and say that okay we need to fix that because it's too wide or something like that We'll we'll have to rework it possibly but as we go forward designing a power cube for the brick press and everything else we should definitely consider the the minimum width consideration as part of the design okay so that's about it for now uh, thanks a lot everybody uh, this is recorded so anyone can watch the beginning if you missed it so thanks a lot and we'll talk next uh, in our design sprint on Saturday bye bye